when I first came up with the idea for the Going Deep Summit, uh, this was just an idea as uh, recently as July. I had an inkling that between the Connection U Facebook group, the audience for the Going Deep Summit, a lot of the connections that I'd made around town, previous guests on the show, and uh, just my experience at events like Thrival, uh, Innovation Works Demo Day, that this is something that people would be into. And when I started to play around with the idea of making this a reality, I had to figure out who would be on stage speaking. And we've had a fantastic lineup so far. Uh, clearly, uh, a ton of talent in Pittsburgh, uh, just kind of ready to explode and, and be a part of a larger conversation. But the very first person that I asked is the next person coming onto stage, and his name is Adam Harridan. Three years ago, I started in a small mastermind group that met every week, and we would talk for about an hour about the stuff that we were working on. At that point, I had not even started the podcast yet. Illusions of anything like this ever happening were not even in existence. And in that small group uh, was a cousin of mine, another friend, and Adam. And Adam was consistently not only impressive in his own accomplishments, but pushing me to uh, out of my comfort zone to go even further with the things that I were, was working on. And I can truthfully say that this would have not happened without him. Um, a lot of my own personal accomplishments would not come to reality, but he's also touched a large number of lives around the Pittsburgh community. He has a website called Learn Your Land. He teaches people, uh, not only skills around foraging, but just understanding nature, understanding the world around them, and really some ancient wisdom that has been lost in previous cultures. Abby touched on that. We've had other folks talk about that, but he is really going to um, drop some serious knowledge on you guys. I'm so excited for it, and I'm really just eternally grateful for him agreeing to do this and for his friendship. So please give a very warm welcome to my friend Adam Harridan. Good afternoon. You have access to the world's greatest mentor. And you've always had access to the world's greatest mentor. And you always will have access to the world's greatest mentor. And you have access to all the lessons that this mentor could ever teach you that you can apply to any area of your life so that you can minimize struggle and maximize meaning. And the best part is, like the coolest part about all this is access is free. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to pull out your credit card. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to wait on any kind of list. Access is entirely free. And it should come as no surprise for you to learn who this mentor is based on the title of this talk, which is <laughs> Lessons from the Land. What nature can teach us about work, happiness, and success. So I want to talk about that S word for a second because it's a very nebulous word. It's very vague to a lot of people because it means something different to everybody. My definition of success might not be somebody else's definition, but it might be pretty close. But maybe we can agree that if we want to be successful in any area of our lives, like whatever that means, we can study, for example, people who are getting the results that we're looking for. We can call them successful people. We can learn from that. We can apply those lessons to our lives. A lot of entrepreneurs might be in here. If we're interested in running a successful business, we can kind of do the same thing. We can study businesses that are getting the results that we're looking for. We can see what they did to get there, see what they didn't do, see what they didn't do well, and we can apply those lessons. We could do the same for successful operations and organizations. And what else is nature? If not the most successful operation and organization, because it's not a disorganization, it's a highly intricate organization, that's been in existence for 4.5 billion years. I think it's the latest estimate. And if there are any botanists or e ecologists in the room, you might correct me and say, well, it's more like 400 million years because that's whenever plants first started colonizing land. Things started looking pretty green out there. All right, so I'll give you 400 million to 4.5 billion years regardless. That's a pretty good track record. I don't know of too many things that have been around for that long. I mean, we're not talking like 25 years. 100 years would be incredible couple hundred million years. I mean, if nature wasn't successful, it wouldn't be here. And if nature wasn't successful, you and I wouldn't be here. So I run an organization that has not been around for that long, and it's called Learn Your Land. And I feel so grateful, so blessed that this is what I get to do. 
I get to take people outside into the woods, into the forest, and teach people about the land. And I'm still learning too, but people still come in these workshops and walks. From all over the country, people come. We talk about plants, trees, mushrooms, and we don't just passively do it. We actively engage with nature, meaning we forage for wild foods, specifically mushrooms. We do a lot of mushrooms as well, foraging that is. So we forage for edible mushrooms. We forage for medicinal mushrooms. We point out the poisonous mushrooms. We don't harvest them. But medicinal mushrooms, you know, that's a hot topic today. These are species that have been utilized for centuries in various cultures around the world for their healing potential. And wouldn't you know that there's so much modern research, literally thousands of studies documenting their anti-cancer properties, anti-tumor properties, anti-diabetic properties, anti-inflammatory properties, immunosupportive properties, and they grow probably in your backyard. If you have trees, you probably have medicinal mushrooms growing there. If you don't think so, just call me up and I'll come over and I'll check it out. <laughs> we also talk about food though. It's not just about medicine, but we learn how to make medicines out of these things too, like really inexpensive medicines that you can consume on a daily basis. We talk about food, we talk about overlooked wild foods, something that a lot of us can positively identify, but for some reason we don't eat it, like the acorn. How many people eat acorns here? One, <laughs> and she's with me. <laughs> we just had acorn pancakes the other day, and it was really, really good. So, I mean, acorns, I mean, we can positively identify them. I think anybody can identify an acorn. Like, there's no question about it. This is a food that has been utilized on at least four different continents for centuries, if not millennia, just being conservative here, for their healing potential, for their nourishing potential, because they are nourishing, they're nutritious, they're sustainable, they're abundant, they're gluten-free, paleo, vegan, non-GMO, naturally organic, they're wild caught. They're every single buzzword in the health community, yet nobody's eating them for some reason. So I teach people how to do that, just introduce people to acorns. I'm not saying you have to eat them, but just look into it, do more research on it. So I talk about all those kinds of things and more during workshops like this. And it's really interesting because I get a lot of comments naturally after these classes and workshops, and probably the most common question that I get has nothing to do with what I told the people or taught the people during that class. And it's a question like this. Hey, Adam, I was at your workshop. I had a lot of fun. Hey, got a question. Where does your passion come from? Like, where does your enthusiasm for all this come from? Because whatever you're eating or drinking, I want some of that. Were you, like, raised by wolves? Were you skinning coons and groundhogs at, like, age three, four, five? Like, were you always like this? Like, where does it come from? And I have to laugh because nobody would ask me that question eight years ago, nine years ago, 10 years ago, because I was not like this growing up. Up to 10 years ago, I didn't know anything about trees, nothing. They were all trees to me. N nothing about a maple tree, oak tree made any sense to me whatsoever. I just didn't even care. I didn't know how to identify three plants in my backyard. Honestly, I probably wouldn't even bet my life on trying to identify dandelion for you. Like, I probably wouldn't even touch that. And I didn't know anything about mushrooms other than the fact that I loved Campbell's mushroom soup growing up. Like, that was my jam growing up. I absolutely loved it. But beyond that, nothing at all. And it's really funny because I love mushrooms right now. I think about them a lot. I look for them. Anytime I'm in the car, I'm looking at trees and looking for mushrooms. I'm still a safe driver, though. Most people would say, hey, Adam, this love of yours is actually an obsession. But just because you dream about it every other night, does that really make an obsession or just like a deep passion? And no joke, I actually dreamed about mushrooms last night. It was a pretty odd dream. And so people want to know, like, where does all this come from? Well, I got here through adversity. I got here through struggle. We've been hearing this theme a lot today, and that's how I got here. And so I assume that a lot of people are interested in finding their passion or mission. That's like a hot topic these days. And I'm not saying you have to do that. Like, do whatever you want to do in life. I'm not here to force anything upon you. For me, I like to be impassioned. I feel really good when I'm backed by a mission. I feel meaning in life when I'm on a mission. And so if that's for you, if you're looking for that in your life, no matter what age you're at right now, because we're always peeling back the layers of the onion, we're always developing new passions and missions, I kind of want to push back on the theory that maybe you should look back to when you're like a child, like six, seven, and eight. What were you into then? Because maybe that should tell you what you should be doing now. That would not work for me, because as I told you, I wasn't like this growing up. If I would take that advice, I'd probably be like a major league baseball player right now like swinging a bat somewhere, and that would not make me happy. You couldn't pay me enough money to do that instead of this. And those people closest to me know that I wouldn't give that up. And I know the world needs Major League Baseball players. That's just not for me. It's like not what I'm going to do. I don't want to do anything with the Ninja Turtles. That's not for me either, even though growing up, like I love that stuff. And so if you tried that formula and it didn't work, that's fine. It might work for some people, wouldn't work for me. And so if you are interested in finding your passion or mission, whatever that means for you, I'll tell you how I did it, because people want to know how I did it. And nobody told me this. 
what I'm about to tell you. I didn't read it anywhere. I didn't see it in a TED Talk. I didn't go to some seminar in California, get all jazzed and motivated and come back and like apply this formula. I just placed faith in a process, like literally blindly, just followed the golden thread and ended up here. And I thought, oh, that's how I did it. Okay, well, I'll teach other people if they're interested in learning how. So how I did it, how you can find your passion or mission is this. Find a problem in your life and fix it. Find a problem in your life and fix it. And it sounds like the easiest thing in the world, but if it is the problem, like capital T, capital P, the problem, it's going to be the hardest thing you've ever had to do, but the most rewarding at the same time. And we all got these problems. I'm talking about like not just like fixing your roof or something like that. That's not a problem. I'm talking about like a deep, deep, deep and dark issue inside of us. For some of you, you know what it is. You could define it right now. For some of us, we're keeping it in the shadows. We're not shining any lights upon it. But I'm telling you, if you could sift through that muck, because we all have it, none of us is immune to it, like you can't get vaccinated against the muck. You can't get your muck shot every year. It just like comes with a package of being a human. But if you could sift through that bucket by bucket and pull it out, there's gold in the process. And you will be passionate about something. You will be on a mission, especially when you implement the second portion of this strategy, which is then spend the rest of your life teaching others how you did it. Help to alleviate struggle in someone else's life. And I'm not saying be a teacher or be a professor or be a YouTuber or stand on a soapbox or anything like that. But if you feel called to help somebody else based on what you learn, then you owe it to yourself and you owe it to them to alleviate that struggle in their lives. And so how did I end up here then? Well, it's through struggle. About 10 years ago, I looked worse than I ever looked in my life and I felt worse than I ever felt in my entire life. I was experiencing some health conditions at the time, didn't know what was going on. All these different physical ailments started creeping up on me, yet I had the foresight to know, and I'm so blessed that I did have this foresight. I don't know where it came from, but I had the foresight to know that if I didn't take care of it then, at that point in time, then 10 years from then, 20 years from then, 30 years from then, the problems would be compounded so much worse and I'd be too sick to be taken care of. And I didn't want to go down that path because I saw too many people going down that path didn't seem rewarding to me. I wanted health sovereignty. I wanted health freedom. I wanted to be able to take care of myself. I didn't want somebody else to have to take care of me. So I dedicated the rest of my life to figuring out my problems, not for selfish reasons, but for selfless, so I could then teach other people how I did it. Help them see things that they weren't seeing. Again, not for selfish reasons, I just felt good doing it. And so I got out a journal. It's the first journal I ever kept. And I've been keeping a journal ever since that day. I hardly missed a day for about 10 years. And the very first thing I ever wrote down, promise yourself you'll never give up. That's a good thing for you guys to write down too. If you have a journal, promise yourself you'll never give up. And that's what I wrote down. And I dedicated the rest of my life to figuring this out. So I went back to school at the University of Pittsburgh for nutrition, started reading hundreds of nutrition books and research articles, started hanging out with the right people, getting rid of the wrong people, started going to workshops and seminars, started eating well, exercise, getting better sleep. And then miraculously, I found my way back into nature. I just found myself there and it felt so good. And then, so there's a better part to all this. I had an aha moment. And I encourage you to seek out those aha moments in life. It means you're on the path. It means you're on, on a mission if you have those aha moments. I had an aha moment only about a year and a half ago. And so I'm telling you, like, once you're on this mission, you're never going to get off of it. And don't get off of it. Just stay on that path. Yes, you're going to make lefts. You're going to make rights. You're going to take detours. It's going to be all ziggy zaggy. But just stay on it because you're going to have a lot of aha moments if you're on the path. And so I had an aha moment just about a year and a half ago. And it was this, that in healing myself from those physical ailments 10 years ago, what I thought was the problem I was actually healing myself from something so much deeper inside of me. Like those problems, those physical illnesses were just gateway problems. The real deep problem was my disconnection from nature. It was my disconnection from the world's greatest mentor, teacher, and guide. And I want you to think of it like this. Imagine that whatever field you're in, whether it's like business, marketing, finances, cello, Ninja Turtles, baseball, whatever it is, imagine the best of the best in your field right now. Like you know who it is, that man or woman and they want to work with you. They want to mentor you. They want to guide you. They know you've got questions. They know you're starting out in this path or you've been on it for a while. And they want to help you along. Yet you don't know it. You're not receptive to their call. And so they're sending you mail, snail mail. Remember that? <laughs> and it's just going to your junk. You're just throwing it away. It's going into your junk mail. Or they're sending you an email and you're hitting the delete button or just going to your spam filter. Or they're calling you on the phone, like, hey, heard about you, want to work with you, and you're not answering the call. 
That's how it was with me in nature for a long time. I wasn't answering the call. And I suffered because of it, and I struggled. And that's how it is with a lot of people today in nature. I don't think we realize the full extent to which nature is a keystone element in determining the quality of our lives. I'm going to say it one more time, because I like that. I don't think we understand the full extent to which nature is a keystone element in determining the quality of our lives. And it might sound like I'm biased because I really like nature, but if you just take a look around the world at the world's healthiest and happiest cultures, past and or present, you see they have one thing in common. It's a common denominator. That's a deep love, a deep respect, a deep connection, and an engagement with their land, with nature. And so whenever I understood this, not just like whenever I read it or like saw it in a TED talk, but whenever I understood this like on a visceral level, I went all in. I was sold. So I started spending a disproportionate amount of my time, my precious time in nature, observing, witnessing, researching, noticing things, and noticing a flow in nature, noticing that things work so well out here, and they've been working well for a couple billion years. And why aren't I experiencing this flow in my life? Why am I struggling in all these areas? And so I started drawing out these lessons and applying to literally every area of my life and watching the needle move forward in those areas. The way that I approach work, the way that I approach other people, the way that I approach my body's health, the way that I talk to people, the way that I listen to people, and allowing the results to speak for themselves. And so that's what I want to talk with you about today. That's the topic of today's presentation. These lessons that I want to share with you that you can apply to any area of your life so that you can minimize struggle and maximize meaning. And before we get started, I just want to say that these lessons aren't going to be esoteric or woo-woo or anything like that. I'm not saying you got to like meditate under like some tree and allow its mouth to speak to you. That might work for some people. Can't say it hasn't worked for me. But I'm talking about real practical, tangible lessons, not just based on observation, but based on research backed by some of the world's leading thinkers, scientists, and researchers today. And so to gain some context on these lessons, we're going to have to dive into the wonderful yet mysterious worlds of botany, a little bit of mycology, a little bit of ecology, but I promise you we're going to have a whole lot of fun. So the three lessons that we're going to talk about, which a lot of people talked about today, I guess that's what you get for speaking later in the day. But we're going to back this up now by what's rooted in nature. Community, creativity, and immersion. So let's talk about the first one. So the first lesson is community. It's not a competition and it never was. So there's this narrative that we've been sold and told our whole lives, and many of us still believe it today. And it's that it's all about competition in nature, right? That that's what makes everything work. That it's ruthless out there. It's every organism out for itself at the expense of other organisms. And while a little bit of competition is healthy, like I totally understand that, what would Pittsburgh and the Steelers be without a little bit of competition? That's definitely not what's keeping everything in the flow. But you can see when we take this competitive mindset to the extreme, how it toxifies our worldview. You can see it in the way people approach their work, the way that they try to acquire money, how they deal with people, how they deal with their spouses, how they deal with themselves, how they treat their community, how they treat their land. But that's not what's going on in nature. Underneath all that, what's really been supporting nature all along for billions of years has been community and cooperation and partnerships and kinships amongst a wide variety of different organisms. And perhaps no organism exemplifies this better in Pennsylvania than the mighty oak tree. I love oak trees. I like identifying oak trees. I like seeing oak trees. I like eating oak trees. I like eating the mushrooms that grow from oak trees. Very few things I don't like about oak trees. And whenever we hear the word oak tree, we think of oak trees, most of us think of strength and vigor and durability, resistance, because the oak tree exudes all those qualities. By anyone's standards, especially botanists and ecologists, oak trees are massively successful. They've been around for tens of millions of years. They've adapted to so many different habitats within the temperate regions of the world. There are hundreds of species worldwide, dozens here in Pennsylvania. They are a massively successful tree. And so wouldn't it make sense, if we want to be successful, to study that? Because it's successful, right? And so who doesn't want to be strong? Who doesn't want to be durable? Who doesn't want to be adaptable in times of extreme? Who does not want those qualities? And so let's study something that exudes strength and vigor and durability and resilience. So what is it about the oak tree then? Like, what's its secret? Because I want some of that. Like, what makes that tree so massively successful? Is it its bark? Like, is it anything innate to the tree? Because if it's its bark, then I'm in trouble. Because I can't make bark. Like, none of us here can make bark. So that would be a horrible example if it was just its bark. I promise you it's not its bark. It's not its leaves. It's nothing really about its tissues. Yes, it has tannic acids in all of its tissues. 
that's not necessarily it. It's not like the strength of its wood. All those things might add up, but what's really been keeping the oak tree so massively successful for tens of millions of years has been its ability to form connections, something Larry talked about, now we're seeing it rooted in nature, connections with a wide variety of organisms in nature, not competing against these organisms, but forming networks, healthy networks, not the superficial networks that Larry was talking about, but these healthy networks. And I'm gonna show you two examples of these networks and how it's really benefiting this tree and how by tapping into networks yourself and healthy communities, you too can gain the strength of an oak tree. So the first connection it makes is not with cotton, but with something in the soil. And farmers and gardeners and mushroom lovers around the world know what this is. This is mycelium. It sounds like a tech startup, like Mycelium Incorporated. But it's not. It's the root-like network. Root-like network, I'm putting that in quotes because it's not really roots, but it's the vegetative portion of a mushroom of a fungus. If you dig through the soil, you're gonna see all these white stringy threads. And it was, is what connects so many different organisms together in nature. And so this is nature's internet. It's the original internet. So we think the, the government and the military created the internet decades ago. Nature created it a long, long, long time ago. And so what this does is it pulls nutrients up into the soil and gives rise to mushrooms. If you look really closely, you'll see four mushrooms there. Maybe these are mushrooms you've never seen before. If you're interested in learning an edible mushroom today, maybe you didn't think you'd learn edible mushrooms today, but this could be your first one ever because it's very easy to identify and has the most unique name that you probably will never forget. Old man of the woods. Old man of the woods. So those are old men of the woods. There's four of them right there. And I hope I can look as good as those old men when I'm a little older. So these mushrooms are formed from that mycelial network. If you would yank these mushrooms up, you would see that they're directly connected to that mycelium. So the mycelium is pulling up nutrients and water, and whenever the conditions are right, it forms this out of nothing, literally out of nothing. That'll keep you up late at night if you just think about that. But it forms these beautiful creatures right here, and they're edible. And if you're interested in foraging for these, look for these near oak trees and beech trees and other hardwood trees, summer months, you have the best of luck finding it, maybe June, July, August, September, October here in Pennsylvania. If you really wanna find them, come out with me sometime and I'll show you where they exist. And they're pretty good, just make sure you cook them first. Now, when we go to the next slide, we will see that those old men in the woods over there on the right aren't just acting in their best interest. You could see something. You could see that their roots, their mycelium, are directly connected to the oak tree's roots. Why do you think that is? It's because the oak tree knows that by connecting with those mushrooms, something that looks nothing like it, it's benefiting tremendously. So how is it benefiting biologically? Well, the mushrooms are pulling up nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and water and shuttling that over to the oak tree. Also, the oak tree is gaining resistance to pathogens and diseases, viruses, bacteria, other fungi, even things like famine and drought and stress. The oak tree is protected to a very large degree because it's partnered with something that looks nothing like it and it's been doing it for a very long time. Now, if you're connected to something or, you're, or if you're in a community, it's not just about what you can get. So the oak tree is not really that interested in all that it can get, but it's also interested in what it can give. And wouldn't you know it that the oak tree, to be in this network, gives up one of its most important products. One of the most important products that could ever possibly create, it sends over and gives it away. And that is fixed carbon. So carbon is like steak in nature. A lot of organisms want carbon, especially mushrooms. So trees photosynthesize. In the summer months, they put out their leaves, they photosynthesize, they fix carbon, they make sugars, and then they send up to 25% of their carbon over to the mushrooms. 25% of their most valued product. Imagine you giving up 25% of your money, 25% of your food, 25% of your most prized belongings, and yet the oak tree knows that if it's going to be successful, it has to do that. And so that beautiful partnership has been in existence for so long, yet we don't really see that if we're just looking above ground. But if we look below ground, we see what's really going on. Now, if we had another oak tree over here to the right of all this, those oak trees would be connected, physically connected via that mycelial network. And they wouldn't be competing with one another. They would help each other out if one of them was stressed or if one of them was sick. And if we go to the next slide, we might assume that, okay, because oak trees are the same, they're in the same genus, which is Quercus, Q-U-E-R-C-U-S, which means beautiful tree, it's of Celtic origin. We might assume that trees of the same species would help each other out, because that would give them the competitive advantage. But what about trees of different species? How about a Douglas fir tree, that's an evergreen tree, that looks nothing like this paper birch tree on the right. One's an evergreen. Many of us brought that home for Christmas. Did anybody have a Douglas fir tree for Christmas? Like you go to a tree farm, you bring it in. Well, if you go to the Pacific Northwest, those Trees grow to be 330 feet tall. Yet we just bring like the seven footers home. That's an evergreen tree. 
that's a paper birch tree. It's a deciduous tree. It loses its leaves every year. Now, we might assume that they might be duking it out in nature, competing for resources. Yet research from the University of British Columbia published very recently found that those trees are connected via mycelial networks and they help each other out when one of them is stressed. If the paper birch tree is stressed in the wintertime, the Douglas fir tree sends carbon over to it to keep it alive and happy and healthy. And the reverse is also true. If the Douglas fir tree is stressed and this one isn't the paper birch tree, it sends nutrients over. That's partnership, that's community, that's kinship. It's not competition. And it never was with those species. So if we go back to the beautiful oak tree, we talked about one connection. That's how the oak tree is a massive success today. Like that's how that specimen's successful. Would you believe that the oak tree also invests in the future to be successful? Like we invest in the future, right? We put our money aside, we hope that it grows. We want the best for our kids, for our grandkids. We want the best for our communities or towns, our land in the future. And so the oak tree knows that if it wants to invest in the future, it has to form another network. It has to form a partnership. And it did so with one of the most unlikely candidates you could ever imagine. And it's this. See, most of us look at that and say, oh, that's a bird. It's a blue jay. But the oak tree says, that's my farmer. That's my gardener. You see, tens of millions of years ago, when the oak trees evolved, so did the jays. They evolved at the same time. In the areas of the world where we see the most diversity of oak trees, we see the most diversity of jays. They co-evolve together. Today, the jay has taken on the very beautiful role of gardener and farmer of oak trees. So we think of farmers as being like Bob down in like rural PA. Bob's a farmer. Or like Mary's the gardener down the street. It's like, no, animals are farmers and gardeners too. And they've been doing a lot longer than human beings. And so what jays do better than any other animal, better than a squirrel, better than a chipmunk, better than a deer, grouse, turkey, bear, they take acorns far away, miles away from the shade of the mother oak tree, and they plant them at the perfect depth in the soil, along edges, tall grass, short grass, forest and field, lawns, gardens, the perfect depth in the soil. Because they don't retrieve them all, a lot of the oak trees grow, and it extends the forest, and extends the forest in a couple more generations, and extends it a little farther. So whenever you see an oak forest, and if you just drive around Pennsylvania, like rural Pennsylvania, and you see a lot of oak forest, thank jays. And whenever you see jays, thank oak trees. Because what does the jay get in return? Because with the oak tree, it's not just about what it gets, it's about what it gives as well. The oak tree gives one of its most valued products, which is the acorn, the most nutritious food for that jay. So cooperation, partnership, it's nothing innate to the oak tree. Whenever you see an oak tree or see any tree or any organism in nature, or you see any of us as well, you think you're just a human being? Do you know how many bacterial species are inside of you? So much more than just you. Whenever we look at the oak tree, it's not an island. It's not successful just because of itself. It's been successful because for tens of millions of years, it's formed these beautiful partnerships. So whenever I look out at nature, I'm constantly seeing these patterns of connection, these communities amongst a wide variety of species. I'm always thinking, like, how can I bring this into my life? Because if that's what's keeping nature in flow, I want some of that in my life. So whenever I created the website Learn Your Land, which Aaron mentioned in the beginning, the very first thing that I wanted to implement was a community in a database, in a network of two groups of people. So naturalists, and you can go there today. If you want to learn anything about plants, trees, mushrooms, specifically in Pennsylvania, you could find somebody who teaches these skills. And I wanted to connect the naturalists with the people who are interested in learning these skills. And I'm happy to say that there are thousands of people utilizing this network today. So whenever you look out at the world, not just nature, but like your world, do so through the lens of cooperation and partnerships. And just like the oak tree, which gains its strength by being tapped into these successful and healthy networks, you too gain your strength in numbers. You've always gained your strength in numbers. And who are you connected to? And how are you benefiting them? And how are they benefiting you? And is that all right with you? And you can make it a goal in 2018. What new connections can you make? What seemingly disparate elements can you blend together? People, ideas, concepts, so that everybody benefits in a brand new way. Because when you look out at the oak tree, it's not just cooperating with something that looks exactly like it, that's right over there, same species, same color, and everything. It's partnering with a little mushroom. And it partners with a lot of mushrooms. And it's partnering with a farmer that we call the blue jay. And so you're not just going to benefit by, impl by implementing these lessons on a physical level or financial or professional, though you might, but you're going to benefit on a deep biological level because that's what we're rooted for in nature. Cooperation, harmony, kinship. It's not a competition, and it never was. So another C word we'll talk about really quickly is creativity. And this is the lesson, the concept of many to flower, few to fruit. So I know there's a lot of creators in here. Every single person's a creator in here. I love creating. I feel really, really good creating. In fact, in my journal, maybe two years ago, I was thinking about, when do I feel really good in life? It's like, oh, whenever I'm creating. 
So I like to create videos. There's a lot of videos on plants, mushrooms, and trees. If you just go to YouTube and search Learn Your Land. I like to create content. I like to create meals. I like to cook a lot. I like to create ferments, like sauerkraut. Does anybody ferment anything in here? Kombuchas or anything like that? I'm fermenting a honey wine right now, which is like a wild blueberry mead, which should mature in about nine to 12 months. So I really like to create things. And I know there's a lot of creators in here. We've got potters, we've got gardeners, farmers, we've got entrepreneurs, we have summit creators here. And as creators, we know that whenever we create something, many times it lands exactly the way that we want it to, right? Like, good job. It landed exactly how we want it to, massive success. That's why we like to create. Many times, though, things don't land the way that we want them to. We work really hard, it feels so good to create, and yet we launch something, we hit publish, we execute on it, and maybe we hear crickets. Anybody ever started a blog, and you worked hard on it, days, weeks, months, and you thought that was enough, and then you hit publish, and just your family read it, or like your best friend read it, or like you publish something on Instagram and Facebook, and you judge your self-worth by how many likes you get. You're creating something, yet you're not getting the results you want. Or maybe even worse, you get negative feedback. People didn't like it. They didn't think it was successful. This happens with me on YouTube a lot, because YouTube, you get the thumbs down. So you publish a video, it's like an hour later, you already get three dislikes. I'm thinking, oh, should I pull that video? Should I like fix it? Did I say something? Did I offend somebody? Like, what was it about that video? And it can be disheartening, because you're looking for one result, and you get a completely different result. You're not thinking that your creations are successful. And yet, when we look at this concept, many to flower, few to fruit, nature has something else to teach us, and it's this. That everything you create, everything that you make, no matter how small you think it is, no matter how insignificant you think it is, no matter how unsuccessful you consider it to be or somebody else considers it to be, it's all indispensable to the ecosystem in support of your overall mission. And the caveat is this, if it feels good creating, if it's coming purely from your heart, then none of it is wasted because nothing that's created in nature is wasted. Not a single thing in nature is wasted. It's all utilized by the ecosystem in support of the overall mission. So let me show you a few examples of this specifically in Western Pennsylvania. Now this is a plant that a lot of you are familiar with, but at the same time, you're not familiar with it. So what do I mean by that? You probably might know it by name. Maybe you've used a product with this plant in it, though maybe you just don't recognize its beautiful flower. So if you ever go to the pharmacy or health food store or a supermarket and you look for a bottle of topical astringent to apply to your skin, to make your skin nice and tight, the pores nice and tight, maybe use the bottle of witch hazel. Anybody ever used witch hazel before? It's all over Western Pennsylvania. We can go down to Shenley Park today, we can go to Frick Park, we can go to Riverview Park, maybe even your backyard if you have some acreage, and find witch hazel. It's a common plant in Western Pennsylvania, the same exact plant that they're putting in that astringent and selling back to you for like 10 bucks when you can just make it really cheaply yourself. And so there are a couple interesting things about witch hazel that applies to what we're talking about in this lesson. The first interesting thing is that the time of year that things, this plant flowers is much different than the flowering times of other plants. Most plants in Pennsylvania flower spring, summer, and fall. I took this photo on the solstice, the winter solstice, not the summer solstice, so winter solstice. So I just took this photo about a month ago in North Park. So this one flowers in the wintertime, when very few pollinators are actually out. There's another interesting thing about witch hazel, which is more applicable to what we're gonna talk about, and it's this. It's got a very low conversion of flowers to fruits, and that could be a problem, because what's supposed to happen in nature, like biologically speaking, with most wildflowers, they're supposed to get pollinated and turn into a successful fruit. And that fruit should contain seeds, the seeds land in the soil, and should germinate into a brand new plant. That would be a reproductive success. If that wouldn't happen, then plants could go extinct. Now, I know that some plants do reproduce vegetatively, but most wildflowers, especially this one, should turn into a fruit. That would be considered a success by many botanists and ecologists. Yet the conversion's very low. So this is a shrub. It's not a very tall tree. It's maybe 20, 30 feet high, 20, 30 feet wide. It could produce maybe 1,000 flowers in a season. How many of those flowers do what they're supposed to do? How many of those flowers do you think actually turn into a fruit and are considered a success? Exact, who, who said that? It's 10. <laughs> less than one, it's 1%. It's less than 1%. And there's actually a paper published on this called Many to Flower, Few to Fruit. So I didn't steal that. Those are researchers' words. Published in the American Journal of Botany in 2002. Less than 1% of the flowers actually do what they're supposed to do. And yet, witch hazel doesn't complain. It doesn't stop creating flowers. It doesn't stop at flower number 500 saying, what's the point? It 
keeps providing those inputs because it knows that that's the amount of creative input that's absolutely essential in order to achieve its desired result, in order to fulfill its destiny of eventually turning into a beautiful brand new witch hazel plant. And at the same time, nothing is wasted. Not a single act of creation, not a single wildflower is wasted because these flowers are utilized by pollinators at a time of the year when very few flowers are out and all the flowers that fall to the soil become compost and feed the ecosystem, which is absolutely essential for that plant and absolutely essential for the future plants. So many things are created. They're not deemed successes by many people, botanists, ecologists, even lay people alike. And yet it's all perfect. It's all good because it all supports the overall mission. Let me show you another example. So those are the fruits, by the way, right there. Those are the flowers. That's what it's supposed to turn into, just to show you. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the fungal kingdom. And we're going to have to change the terminology because mushrooms don't have flowers, they don't have seeds. They reproduce through spores. And the spores should be ejected underneath where that white stuff is. That's a photo of the same mushrooms on the left, then on the right, that's the underside on the right. Spores are released, many spores are released, and what would be a success would be for the spores to land in a suitable habitat, germinate, turn into that mycelium that we talked about, in the beginning, that cottony material, and eventually give rise to a brand new mushroom. So this is a fantastic medicinal mushroom. If there's one mushroom that you learn ever in your entire life, it's this one right here. This is the reishi mushroom, Ganoderma suge. It's a medicinal mushroom that's been utilized for centuries, specifically in China, and it has documented anti-cancer properties, anti-histamine properties, anti-inflammatory properties, and immunosupportive properties. This is one of the first medicinal mushrooms that I was introduced to. It's very common here in Pennsylvania. You can make teas and alcohol extractions out of it. You can consume it and you can feel really good at the same time. Almost every single day for the past seven years, this has been a staple of my medicinal strategy. So I really, really like this mushroom and it's very easy to identify. So you guys have two new mushrooms that you can go find. But this one grows in the summer months. So you're gonna find this right alongside Old Man of the Woods. Now, the spores should release and turn into mycelium, which should turn into a brand new mushroom. This one will release billions of spores in its lifetime. Billions of spores. Some mushrooms will release trillions of spores. But let's be really conservative and just talk about billions. How many of those billions of spores do you think will actually germinate and turn into... <laughs> one. The answer is one. That mushroom has a one in a billion chance, and this is published, it's not just me making this up, one in a billion chance of actually germinating, not to even turn into a mushroom, hopefully to eventually give rise to a mushroom. And yet, Rishi doesn't complain. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop at spore number 500 million saying, what's the point? Nothing's a success. Nothing's turning out the way it's, they think it should. No, it knows that that's the amount of creative input that's absolutely essential in order to achieve its desired result. That it, if it wants to get from a little spore to a big mushroom, it better keep pumping in those creative inputs. And at the same time, no spore is wasted because it's all created intentionally. Nature doesn't waste anything. Nothing has to come and cart out those spores. Say, let's clean it up here. All right, you're done, Rishi. It's enough. No. Every single spore is utilized. A lot of organisms eat those spores, bacteria and slime molds. We can talk about slime molds on one of my walks if you ever come on one of those. They're fantastic little organisms that kind of look like mushrooms, but they're not. And also those spores in mass are nutrients. They're big packets of fertilizer for the soil, which supports not only mushrooms in this generation, but future generations as well. So, so many things are created, not deemed successes by many people, yet it's all perfect and it all supports the overall mission. One more example, we're gonna talk about a very easy tree that you could positively identify. And the more trees that you can positively identify, the happier you are in life. That's not backed by any research, it's just been my experience. But it's directly correlated. The more trees you identify, the happier you are. This is one of the easiest trees to identify. It's the American beech tree. The reason it's so easy to identify is because the bark is so smooth. It's one of the smoothest bark tree species in Pennsylvania. So if you're walking through any woods and you find a tree, really smooth bark, American beech tree. Now, a large tree will grow to be about 115 feet tall, and it can grow for 400 years. Like, that's a successful tree. In its lifetime, it can produce 1.8 million nuts. Now, nuts are like seeds, and they should land in the soil, germinate, turn into big trees that will eventually replace this one right here, because if it didn't, then we wouldn't have any large beech trees. The beech trees could go extinct. Now, 
in its lifetime, 1.8 million nuts, how many of those nuts do you think will hit the soil and eventually turn into a large tree, large enough to replace this one here? Not how many will germinate, but how many will eventually turn into a 100 foot tall tree that will grow to be 300, 400 years? How many out of 1.8 million? <laughs> one. Only one out of 1.8 million nuts will actually turn into that massive success right there. And yet, I've never heard a beech tree complain, ever. It doesn't stop producing nuts at 1.1 million or 1.5 million. It goes all the way up to 1.8 million because it knows that that's the amount of creative input that's absolutely essential in order to achieve its desired result. In order to fulfill its destiny, it has to keep doing it. And at the same time, nothing that it creates is wasted. Not a single thing is, uh, is wasted because it's all created with intent. Think how many nuts actually fertilize the ecosystem, giving support for not only that tree, but future trees. They feed the animals. And here's an interesting point. Many of those nuts do germinate, but they never make it past 20, 30 feet tall. They remain in the understory. They're like the smaller projects that are absolutely essential to support the taller tree as it grows and grows and grows. So we covered a lot. What the heck does all this mean for us creators and makers and shakers and doers? It means if you like creating, if it feels really good to you, then keep doing it. Keep doing it, keep doing it, and keep doing it. Because everything that you create, no matter how small you think the results are, no matter how insignificant you think they are, no matter how unsuccessful you consider it to be or somebody else considers it to be, it's all indispensable to the ecosystem in support of your overall mission. That if you want to get from here to here, you have to keep providing those creative inputs and nothing is wasted as long as it's coming from the heart. So that's a, that's a caveat as long as it's coming from the heart. You gotta keep putting in those creative inputs day after day, week after week, month after month, season after season. And although the odds might seem to be stacked against us, like less than 1% in many cases, the odds aren't zero. The possibility always exists. And so many to flower, few to fruit, and yet, you know what the strange twist of events in all this is? Like the great cosmic giggle embedded in all this? The flowers oftentimes are more beautiful than what they're supposed to turn into. They're more beautiful than the fruits, many times, meaning, Savor the journey, because the journey oftentimes is more rewarding than the actual result that we're seeking. So we only got like two seconds left. So this is the final lesson out of an infinite times infinity amount of lessons that we could ever possibly talk about. And if you want to learn more, let's just hang out in the woods sometimes and we'll figure it out. But this last lesson is the call to action. It's like, what can we do here? So immersion, this is a direct quote from nature, by the way. So nature says, you can't do it without me. Not in a condescending way, but in a truthful way. You can't do it without me. We can try. We could try our very best, but we're always going to do it more efficiently. We're always going to do it with less struggle when we implement the lessons of nature. You know, we're living in an interesting time right now. It's kind of like the biohacking revolution. Everyone's trying to biohack their way into things to feel good. We're trying to biohack our way out of things to feel good. We're looking for quick fixes. We really like those pills, supplements, new oils we can add in our coffee. <laughs> And yet I think we're forgetting what the fundamental biohack is, like the original biohack, which is in order to feel good, spend more time in nature. And look, the research is so conclusive on this. Like it is definitive, it's more definitive in this area than in any other area. If we spend more time in nature, the better we feel. The more time we spend in nature, the better our moods are. The more time we spend in nature, the more creative we are, the more inspired we are, the less stressed we are, the higher our vitamin D levels. And yet we shouldn't treat nature like a supplement, like, in order to feel better, let's go hang out in nature. No, that's the biological norm to feel so good. That's the biological norm to feel so good, to feel so inspired. That's how we're supposed to feel. That's the biological norm to have such high vitamin D levels. And so the researchers and the media should frame it the other way and say, look, if you're not spending time in nature, this is how much worse your health will be. This is how much worse your creativity will be. This is how much worse your mood will be. This is how much worse your sleep will be. And ultimately, better than any pill, better than any supplement. Ultimately, there's this thing, it's called nature. It's been around for a while. It's free and it's largely free from side effects. So what's the call to action here? How do we implement all these lessons? What can we do about this? Well, I think you know what the answer is. Spend more time in nature, whatever that means to you. Whatever it means to you. I'm not here to say like it has to be this amount of time, this often. No, if it's one day in February that you can squeeze into your schedule, that's perfect. Can you go for a walk somewhere? Can you sit? in your backyard, notice things. How many birds are out? How many trees are out? Do the trees have leaves on them? Do the trees not have leaves on them? Does that mean they're dead? Or is it just a deciduous tree? How's it smell out here? How do I feel out here? Notice those things. Maybe you could just pencil in a trip to an old growth forest this summer, just one weekend. You know, it's a lot easier than you think. 
because if you can drive two hours, you can make it to one of the last remaining old growth forests in the entire northeastern United States. And if you live in Pennsylvania, you're so lucky to live so close to it because it's called Cook Forest. And it's one of the most magical spots on earth. Can you just put that into your schedule one weekend, just a two hour drive? It'll change your life forever. Or maybe that's too much. Can you just bring nature to you? Can you bring a plant home? And I'm not saying like dig up a rare, threatened, endangered native plant or anything like that. But can you just buy a plant and bring it home? We could start with that. Can you water it? Can you give it sunlight? Can you help it to grow, help it to thrive? And wouldn't you know, probably do the same for you as well. So to circle back to the beginning, just understand that you have access to this mentor, nature. I'm not granting it to you. You have it. And you've always had it. And you always will. And you have access to all the lessons that this mentor could ever teach you that you can apply to any area of your life so you can minimize struggle, maximize meaning. And the best part is it's free. So we covered a lot, and I know it might not all make sense today. It might not all make sense a couple years from now. It might not make sense five years from now, but perhaps on the first day of the seventh year, it all makes sense. Thanks a lot. If you want to connect, if you want to go out in the woods sometime with me, feel free to connect right there. And thank you, Aaron, wherever you are. You're doing great stuff. Adam cited the research a lot there, but I think the best testament to the power of what he's selling is the energy that he just displayed over the last 45 minutes, right? Uh, do we have any questions for Adam? Anyone got anything on their mind? I see one person. Okay, first comment, great speech, this was fun. Um, <laughs> I picked up a book about three months ago called Biomimicry where this company in uh, Japan was looking at nature to innovate the, um, you know, their speed trains because it was making too much noise and they looked at a few different animals and innovated off of their, you know, biological design and fixed the problem. And, you know, biomimicry, evolution, it's kind of like nature's way of innovating. And us as entrepreneurs, you know, we're looking for problems to innovate and solve in the marketplace and trying to deliver a product or a service. Um, how does nature find problems? How does it find problems? Yeah, how does it find problems and recognize it's a problem? Nature is vastly intelligent. It's more intelligent than we'll ever, ever understand. Yet, wherever the problem exists, the solution is always there. It's always been there or else it wouldn't be here today. And I think as human beings, because we have such short lifespans, relatively speaking, what we consider to be a problem is not even the slightest problem in the universal scale. For example, hemlock trees, are being really threatened right now in Pennsylvania because of an insect called the hemlock woolly delgid. That's our state tree, by the way. And so most hemlock forests are completely wiped out. And all these people are trying to figure out what's going on, what can we do to stop it? And most of the trees have died. Yet in Cook Forest, where they are treating it, they are stopping the problem to some small degree, but the consequences don't seem to be so good because they're injecting these poisonous chemicals into the soil, and they're considering releasing these beetles as well that aren't native, and that could cause more problems. And yet, 5,000 years ago, the hemlock trees were almost wiped out completely. That's what the record shows. And they came back even stronger. And so nature solved problems on huge time scales that we just can't see, yet it always figures out a way to do it. And I think it's the problems that we see are just problems in humans' eyes. They're not problems in nature's eyes. And to fix anything, it sounds like it's too easy to be true, but spend time in nature and you will get the answers. That's all I have for you on that. Thank you. <laughs> from what Can I've learned from what I've studied. But thanks for the great question. You also once gave an anecdote. I think it was someone getting like bitten by a tick and potentially, I don't know if it was Lyme disease or something else, but the, like, the area where there is often ticks, there's also often a plant nearby that is a remedy for yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about that. Lyme disease is a huge topic these days. People say don't talk about sex, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion, don't talk about Lyme disease either because everybody has something to say about it. And so what we were talking about maybe many months ago was that, and I just kind of answered this with the, with the past question, wherever there's a problem, nature has a solution. They're married to each other. They're right there on top of each other. So Lyme disease is a serious issue in Pennsylvania. I think Pennsylvania is leading in the number of cases of Lyme disease, an incredibly debilitating condition. What's interesting is that one of the number one herbal treatments for Lyme disease, its region, its area of occupancy overlaps that of Lyme disease. And it's a non-native species known as Japanese knotweed. And yet that is a problem to a lot of people that Japanese knotweed is so prevalent here in Pennsylvania. And yet, 
it contains a compound known as resveratrol, which has been documented to have antispiroketal activity, and that bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, that causes Lyme disease, is a spirochete. And wherever Lyme disease is, you see that some of the solutions might be right on top of it. And that's not the only example. There are many examples of that. And there's that old adage or cliche, and maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't, that whatever you need, it's literally right there in your backyard. So perhaps these things keep popping up where we need it most. So we think they're problems, but literally the solution is right there, and the solution is always more apparent anyway. It's just we have to like put down our phones, stop looking at billboards in the news, and just look for things outside, and we'll see the solutions there. Yes. All right, Adam, I have never been more pumped up about like learning about <laughs> ecology, and I would love to see you get like a TV show. I've got a tweet composed to Discovery, Nat Geo, PBS, Animal Planet, but before, without, before sending that, I'd like to get a sense of what you would like to do with Learn Your Land. What's, what's next? It's always what's just to get up? people to literally learn your land, not just hang out in nature, but to actively engage with it. I used to be one who would just hike outside. And it was never so deeply as satisfying as hiking and knowing that the oak trees are here next to me. The maple trees are over there. Oh, there's some plants over here. What plants are they? Oh, it looks like there's some Dutchman's breeches in springtime. You never, ever, ever feel alone as long as you can identify things. And we're talking today about like, how can we protect nature? You can't protect what you don't know. Like if you don't know something, you can't protect it. So the whole environmental movement should really focus on learning the land first, because if you learn something, you know it, you start to love it, and you'll want to protect it more than anything in the world. And so my whole thing is, yeah, it's great to be outside, but it's also better to actively engage in whatever way that means for you. I like to eat it, because everybody has to eat here, right? Like, nobody exists without eating, and why not make some of those food choices the foods from the wild? And if you are what you eat, you're nature. Eat nature and you will love it more than anything because that becomes who you are. So active engagement is the name of the game with me. Awesome. Would you be down for a TV show? 100%. All right. <laughs> Let's give it up one more time for Adam Harridan. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron.